Good morning, church. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it is a new, another change for us. We're excited to do it. We're excited to get to worship with you guys at home uh, and also on Sunday mornings here in this building. So I'd just like to take a moment and just pray with you. And, uh, and Lord, I just pray that, pray that you bless this worship service this morning, God. I just pray that for people who are in this building, watching online, wherever you may be, God, I just pray that, uh, that you be filled with the Holy Spirit, that it just, that it just be overwhelming and that, uh, and that this worship time just be so fulfilling for, for you and us, of course. And uh, we just want to go ahead and get into our worship time right now, Lord, and uh, we just thank you.
Stop. 
God, Lord, thank you for being our leader, Lord. Lord, thank you for being the one who shows us the way that shows us the way to you, God. And Lord, we just, uh, we're so happy to be able to give you our praise and worship this morning. Just sing to the heavens your wonderful name, God. And we just, uh, we love you. And that's why we praise you. In your son's beautiful name we pray, amen. As we've come to our time of communion this morning, uh, I'd like to read a little bit out of uh, 1 John chapter 3, uh, starting with verse 16, and it's the NLT version. I kind of like the way that one was worded a little bit better. And it says, we know what real love is because Jesus gave up his life for us. So we also ought to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. If someone has enough money to live well and sees a brother or sister in need but shows no compassion, how can God's love be in that person? Dear children, let's not merely say that we love each other. Let us show the truth by our actions. And it's so true in this day and age where uh, actions speak so much louder to words. And I know that's how it works for me and that's how it's worked for me my entire life. And and acts, and that's, that's why what Jesus did for us by going to the cross was the greatest act of love. By giving up his life, he set an example. He set an example of how we need to be to each other as his children and his followers. And that's why we remember him on this, uh, in this time and partake in the elements. So on that night, when Jesus was with his disciples, Jesus took the bread, breaking it, giving thanks, saying, this is my body given for you. Eat in remembrance of me. And in that same way, Jesus took the cup, the cup of the new and everlasting covenant in his name and said, drink, drink it and remember me. Lord, we thank you, God. Lord, we thank you for your son. We thank you for, for the gift that was his life for all of us here on earth, Lord. And we just, we just want to give him all the glory that he deserves. In your son's beautiful name we pray, amen. Good morning. It's good to have you with us this Lord's Day as we worship together and hear from God's Word. This morning, I'm going to uh, be speaking using uh, the text from Hebrews. I'm going to be reading chapter 12, verse 28 through 13, 6. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. Let brotherly love continue. And do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Remember those who are in prison as though in prison with them, and those who are mistreated, since you also are in the body. Let marriage be held in honor among all. And let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Keep your life free from the love of money, and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Let me start by, by giving a, a quick overview 
of the last three chapters of the book of Hebrews. Uh, chapter 11 gives us what might aptly be called the, the hall of God's hall of fame. The, the writer uh, lists all of those who through biblical history were faithful to God's call. In spite of their frailties and in spite of their sin and in spite of their treatment by the world. Note verses 32 to 40 uh, in chapter, chapter 11. This is what it says uh, that, uh, and he, the writer, after listing a number of the faithful, uh, those who were famous in God's hall of fame, if you will, he says this, what more shall I say? For time would fail to tell me of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword and were made, and made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war and put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection and some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. And they were stoned and they were sawn in two and they were killed by the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, and mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. What I want us to understand in that section is, is that many times people think that if we are God's people, we have special privileges, and we do in some ways, but not necessarily the way we're treated by the world. In fact, these verses became very personalized a few years ago when our son was in a head-on collision on Highway 42, and three people died in that accident. But our son was, one, was uninjured. And many that knew us at the time came up to us and as they heard the story or read it in the newspaper, they said, boy, the Lord was really with your son. To which I replied, I think the Lord was with everyone in that accident. Because the three people that died were a minister's wife and two seminary students coming home from a religious retreat in Bandon. And, and so it, it helps us to understand that, that outward circumstances does not necessarily mean we are out of God's will or not. But after listing the heroes of faith in the Old Testament, the writer points out that they really are our witnesses to our walk with Jesus and are a part of our encouragement as we follow Jesus. I mean, in chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, it starts out, Therefore, since we are surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. And then later on, as he goes through chapter 12, it's, there's, it's followed by a section of how, how God disciplines his children, just as any loving father would, would discipline his child in order to correct them and to strengthen them and to put them on the right path. He, he gives this obvious truth in chapter 12, verse 11. He says, for the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later, 
it yields, it, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness by those who have been trained by it. And near the end of chapter 12 and the beginning of chapter 13, there are these amazing words of promise and encouragement. Let us, therefore, be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus, let us offer acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to, to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. Remember those who are in prison as though in prison with them, and those who are mistreated, since you also are in the body. Let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexual immoral, sexually immoral and adulterous. Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. For what can man do to me? It is this section that I want to unpack a little bit this morning. Starting with that verse, therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. The text was written to a people that were familiar with earthquakes. They had been shaken and had seen or at least heard of the devastation of earthquakes. I mean, there is something about it when the earth starts to move under your feet. Things that felt solid before suddenly start moving. I remember sitting through our first earthquake when we lived in Southern California when I was going to school. But there was also among these people, and I think among us, the fact that they had been shaken by social and governmental earthquakes. Our world has been shaken. I mean, who would have... Who would have predicted 12 months ago, if we just go back a year, what life would be like today in our world. Or just this past week, Beirut was shaken. It reminded me of 1959 in Roseburg, when 12 tons of ammonium nitrate exploded and leveled nine city blocks, put a crater in the ground six foot deep and 20 feet wide through the pavement. 12 tons. By comparison, Beirut was shook by 2,700 tons. That would shake any city. And I'm sure most of you saw the impact of that blast. And even though we have had very few cases here in Coos County, COVID-19 has shaken our country. I, I mean, there, it is the fact that 170,000 people have died nationwide. And to put that a little in perspective, if you add up all the casualties from the Vietnam War, the Iraq War, and to date in Afghanistan, 61,000 soldiers have died in three wars and 170,000 have died already from COVID-19. The writer of Hebrews tells us that as Christians, we are part of a kingdom that cannot be shaken, no matter what is falling apart around us. And for that, we are to be grateful and to worship God. Gratitude and worship just go together. And there are no two ways about it. Grateful people are just happier than the rest of humanity. And after this statement of confidence, of confident assurance, Paul gets down to the practical side of how we are to live out our faith when we are surrounded by chaos and turmoil. 
It's kind of like the poster that was put out in Britain during World War II or, or that was in waiting to be used in, in case there was an invasion. It was that poster that said, keep calm and carry on. That's what Paul is saying here. But then he outlines some very practical measures that we can do to show that Jesus makes a difference in our life. And the first one is this. He says, let brotherly love continue. Note this. Jesus said, by this will all men know that you are my disciples by the way that you love one another as I have loved you. Here, Paul speaks of brotherly love. I, out of curiosity, I looked up uh, on the internet a little bit about uh, Philadelphia, you know, our city of brotherly love. There are riots and protests, not much brotherly love in the city of brotherly love these days. In today's world, brotherly love and hospitality will stand out, especially in a world of turmoil. Then secondly, he says to remember those who are in prison and those who are mistreated. Quite honestly, Paul is not talking about looters and rioters, but about those who are imprisoned or mistreated for their faith. In fact, it's kind of interesting, looters and rioters don't really seem to be going to prison these days. But listen to what one secular orator said in, of first century Christians. Aristides wrote this. He says, regarding Christians, if they hear that any one of their number is imprisoned or in distress for the sake of their Christ's name, they all render aid in his necessity. And if he can be redeemed, they set him free. Paul writes, let brotherly love continue. And I would add, even in difficult times, and even more so in difficult times, that we should show hospitality, remembering those who are imprisoned for their faith and ill-treated. And then he says, hold marriage in high honor. It's a hard message to get across in our world today. For the true meaning of marriage is, is continually under attack. In public, in the news, on television, even sitcoms, God's word makes it abundantly clear that marriage is by God's design and is between one man and one woman intended for life. Listen to the words of Jesus in Matthew 19. Jesus said, from the beginning, God created us male and female. And for this very reason, he says, the fact that we are created male and female, and that's it, folks. A man will leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Marriage was ordained by God long before the Supreme Court existed and states started to redefine marriage. In fact, if I were a Supreme Court justice, I would worry just a little bit, especially in light of the next few words in, in that verse where it says, and God will judge their immorality. God will judge the judge's immoral decisions. And then he says, not only are we to honor marriage, we are to keep our life from the love of money and be content with what we have. In Philippians 4, 11 through 13, the Apostle Paul writes this, I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and facing want, abundance and need. But I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You might be thinking, well, Paul never had to deal with COVID-19, or some of you may be thinking he never had to deal with my husband or my wife. But remember where Paul was when he wrote this letter. 
in a first century Roman prison. But Paul had learned a secret. And a secret by definition is a bit of knowledge that is not commonly known. And from my perspective, it is still a pretty tightly held secret. Not because it can't be uncovered, but because people can't believe it's actually that easy. Most of us think in terms if I had this or that, I could be happy or be content. If I had a new job or if I had a new spouse or if I had a a new car or a new house, any number of things we think if we had just had this, we would be content. But Paul had learned to be content with what he had and where he was because he focused on a different list. For Paul was convinced that he had eternal life. He was convinced that his sins were forgiven. Not bad for a guy who declared himself the worst of all sinners. He was convinced that he had the amazing love of God. And he had an earnest deposit of salvation. He had Christ, the hope. Of glory. And with all that, what else does one need? An interesting detail about the letter to the Philippians is that it's 104 verses long. And in that those verses, Paul mentions Jesus over 40 times, once every two and a half verses. How often do you and I think about Jesus during our conversations? You see, a, that was Paul's cer- secret that you and I can learn. For a Christ-based contentment turns us into a joyous people. And since no one can take away our Christ, no one can take away our gratitude or our joy. In one of his books, Max Lucado writes this, Christ can give you a happiness that can never be taken away away, a grace that will never expire, and a wisdom that will ever increase. For Jesus is a fountain of living hope. For about 10 years, Kay and I had a boat at the Coos Bay City Dock. The level of the bay would rise and fall with the tide. The boat would would rock back and forth with river traffic, sometimes even violently when someone forgot the speed limit out on the bay. But though the level changed and the boat rocked, it never drifted because the boat was securely anchored. If you and I anchor our life in Christ, our boat might rock, our situation may fluctuate, but we will not drift, for our anchor in Christ is secure. And we can be grateful that we have a kingdom that cannot be shaken. For Jesus has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear, for what can man do to me? Shall we pray? Our God and Father, we come before you this day. We praise you for this day, for for the hope that we have in Christ. Lord, we are grateful. And this day we worship and honor you with all our being. For you are our helper. Father, we ask that you will guide us and direct us through this week. Father, we pray for anyone who who needs and wants to accept your son as Lord and Savior of their life. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Today... I also would like to remind you that if you'd like to support our ministry, you can give online 
or, or mail your check to the church. Let's pray as we close. And I hope that you will remember that no matter what happens this week, that you and I can have a confidence that Jesus will never leave or forsake you. For Jesus is our helper. In his name we pray. Amen.